Welcome, Dan Mama. Released in Japan in April 1989, with a North American release taking place just a few months later, the Nintendo Game Boy was an absolute phenomenon, and kick-started a craze for handheld consoles that lives on to this day. The Game Boy quickly faced competition from the likes of the full-colour Atari Lynx and Sega Game Gear, as well as a selection of much more similar portables that hoped to emulate its success, and it's those much more obscure competitors that we're going to be looking at in this video. Handhelds ripped off the Game Boy's design, cloned its games, lowered its prices and tried to piggyback on its success, hoping to fool unsuspecting parents all over the world. But most of them disappeared almost as soon as they arrived and never even appeared on Nintendo's radar. So let's get on with it then and look at five of the Game Boy's long forgotten rivals. Also known as the Cougar Boy, the Mega Duck was originally produced by Hong Kong based electronics manufacturer Timlex, before being distributed worldwide under both the Videojet and Creatronic brands, under which it was better known. Hitting the market in 1993, it came much later than the other handhelds on this list, but was sold incredibly cheaply to make up for it. The Mega Duck was most successful in South America, where it was sold as the Cougar Boy USA, or simply Cougar USA tricking customers into believing the product originated from the United States. It struggled to break into European markets, but was widely distributed in the Netherlands of all places. On a hardware level, the Mega Duck was remarkably similar to the Game Boy, verging on being an all-out clone, with a Z80 processor, 4-channel sound chip, 4 grayscale graphics and identical controls. Even the design of the cartridges and the system itself were very similar, in fact, a number of Mega Duck games, such as Sachin's Worm Visitor and Zip Ball, were later released for the Game Boy 2 in near identical form. As well as the aforementioned Sachin, who were already well known for producing unofficial Nintendo NES games, Timlex International themselves and Comin also released games for the Mega Duck. A total of 37 games were released for the handheld during its short life, with all of them coming out in 1993. It's not clear when the Mega Duck was discontinued or how successful it was, but the hardware was later turned into an educational laptop for children, which was released in Germany by Hartung as the Mega Duck Super Junior Computer and in Brazil as a Super Quique. The Hartung Game Master is a very unique handheld for one specific reason. Unlike all the other consoles on this list, and indeed most handhelds in general, this one does not originate from Asia, and was actually developed by a German company back in 1990, coming out shortly after the release of the Game Boy. Whilst Hartung distributed the console throughout most of Europe themselves, they did also license it to several other companies too, including Videojet in France, Impel in Italy, and Systema in the UK. I myself own the UK model, which was actually renamed as the Systema 2000, and have previously reviewed it on my channel. If you want to watch that video in full, then just click the link in the top right hand corner. This version is particularly interesting as Systema already had a very solid reputation for producing cheap and cheerful LCD games that could be found in major high street stores like Dixon's and Toys R Us. However, they weren't able to replicate that success with their Game Boy competitor, and although the console had some pretty good visibility and distribution at first, it disappeared from the market in less than a year. However, a year or so later, a remodel of the same hardware called the Game Plus appeared in France only. This closely resembled the looks of the Game Boy rather than the horizontal orientation of the original system, but was incompatible with existing games. This is even rarer and harder to find than the original models. It's unknown how popular the various variations of the handheld were, but the original Harton Game Master seems to be the most common one to find, followed by the Italian model. Indeed, when I was trying to find games for my unit, I bought a job lot of brand new cartridges from a seller in Italy and instantly completed the whole set of 19 games. This lack of titles also hints at the system's lack of success. Speaking of those games though, most of them are very simple and blatant copies of other people's titles, like Tetris, Dr Mario and Air Sea Battle. They were never sold in proper boxes either, just simple plastic or cardboard cartons with basic designs. 
Though Hartung disappeared from the video game industry not long after, Systema stuck around creating their cheap handheld games and even released another console in the form of the TV Boy, an Atari 2600 clone that was full of illegal bootleg games. I still have no idea how they got away with that. Ok, so the Game Child isn't strictly a Game Boy clone, as it wasn't actually a portable console. It was just a standalone range of LCD games that came in a case remarkably similar to Nintendo's portable. For that reason alone, I felt it was worthy of inclusion here, but also because the system has gained some notoriety in recent years thanks to the excellent movie Ashens and the Quest for the Game Child. It's unknown who actually produced the Game Child or when it was first released, but it's thought that it originates in the early 90s. It came in three different versions which all look the same but contained a different game. This was only identifiable by a small sticker or mark on the box, which is actually often wrong, and the three titles on offer were Football, Desert War and Space War. I have actually looked at a Game Child handheld containing the latter game on my own channel, so click the link up in the top right hand corner if you want to know more about it. Despite it looking very similar to the Game Boy in both its design and size, even going to the trouble of having a fake cartridge port, the Game Child offers a much smaller screen and different button layout. All three games are very simple and also not very good, even young children wouldn't have been fooled by the Game Child. These handhelds are now quite collectible, mainly thanks to the obsessions of one Stuart Ashen. Released in early 1990, the Game 8 was the first handheld to try and cash in on the success of the Game Boy, and one of the best known examples too. This portable was originally created by Taiwanese company Bitcorp, who are probably best known for creating Atari 2600 games like Bobby is Going Home, Open Sesame and Phantom Panzer. But they did also release a number of games for both the Nintendo NES and ColecoVision 2. In fact their relationship to the latter resulted in the company's very first console, the Dina 2-in-1, which has a very interesting story of its own. Originally created as an illegal clone of the ColecoVision that was also able to play games from the hardware similar Sega SG-1002, hence the 2-in-1 part, it ended up being licensed to mail order game specialists Telegames. They had previously been an official distributor for the ColecoVision in Europe and North America, and once Coleco stopped production they wanted to continue selling the system and its games, so they acquired the rights from Coleco to distribute the Dina officially as the Telegames personal arcade and also rebranded and re-released Bitcorp's range of ColecoVision games under the Telegames moniker too. However, they turned down the chance to license the game mate, having already committed to supporting the rival Atari Lynx. And instead, Bitcorp found other partners such as well-known UK joystick manufacturer Cheetah, Italian toy company Gig, and German electronics company Yeno, who had previously released a fully licensed version of the Epoch Super Cassette Vision in Europe, as well as rebranded Sega SC3000 computers. The hardware inside the Game Mate was actually pretty comparable to the Game Boy as you can see, however the unit was severely let down by its poor quality screen that suffered greatly with blurring. Looks wise the Game Mate was similar to the Sega Game Gear, which was actually released later, so perhaps there was some inspiration for another system here, with its horizontal orientation. It has a standard two fire buttons, 8 way joypad start select and dials to control both the brightness and volume. Perhaps most interestingly the games came in card format, like its other rival the Atari Lynx though they closely resembled the look of both the PC Engine Hue cards and Sega My Cards. The total of 72 games were released for the game mate with Bitcorp themselves producing the vast majority of them. Although third party publishers did exist for the handheld, such as Phoenix and UMC, the console achieved little success outside of its homeland and all rights for the system were sold to fellow Taiwanese company Funtech after Bitcorp went bust in 1992. The game mate was discontinued just a year later, with promised revisions of the handheld never appearing. Of all the failed Game Boy wannabes on this list, the Supervision was by far the most successful. Originally created and released by Taiwanese electronics company Vatara in 1992, it was also licensed to a number of other companies for regional distribution, much like most of the other handhelds on this list in fact. Also like another portable I've covered already, the Supervision was licensed to a well-known manufacturer of joysticks in Quickshot. The console was also licensed to Hartung in Germany, which seems bizarre when you consider they already had their own Game Master handheld, Audio Sonic in France and Electro Lab in South America. It was the UK version of the handheld that had the most success by far, 
mainly thanks to QuickShock's excellent marketing that saw them land the console a spot on the popular ITV TV show Bad Influence, where it could be seen being played by co-presenter Violet Berlin on regular occasions. This relatively small level of success in my homeland even saw QuickShock commission UK-based developer Bits to create new games for the supervision, including a port of QuickShot's own Atari 2600 game Snake. With a number of other developers in Taiwan and Hong Kong also producing games for the supervision, its games library went on to include 69 commercial titles, not far off the amount of its much more successful rival the Atari Lynx. QuickShot also promoted the handheld to the mainstream press at the CES show in 1992, where it received a rather mediocre reception. Without doubt, the most unique feature of the Supervision was its tabletop-like design that actually allowed you to either hold it flat in your hands or put it down and tilt the screen to face you. Although within a year of the system's release, a new model was produced that much closer resembled the looks of the Game Boy. With the handheld priced at under £50 with games at less than £15 each, it's easy to see why the Supervision was able to pick up some traction. Unfortunately, the Supervision's early momentum was soon killed off by dramatic price cuts by their biggest rivals, that saw the Game Boy only costing £10 more and the full colour Atari Lynx being sold at £30 extra. Watara and Quickshot tried to fight back by announcing a new colour version of the handheld that would arrive late in 1993, as well as a number of new third party and first party games, including big name licences like The Terminator and Rambo. However, neither the colour handheld nor the new games ever arrived, and the supervision was quietly discontinued, instead with Quickshot returning to their core controller market. Due to the small amount of success the Supervision had, it's still quite easy to find on online auction sites, although many of the games have now become extremely rare. Passa Supervision, ti conviene! C'è già il fantastico Chris Paul incluso! E poi c'è Alien, pilota la tua astronave! Blockbuster, un incontro di difficoltà! Carrier, e vai d'astuzia! Supervision, il nuovo portatile con maxi schermo! Adesso lo sai, Supervision! And that rounds out my look at five forgotten Game Boy clones. Now it's your turn to speak and I want to know if any of you owned one of these back in the day and what are your memories of it? Or perhaps you started to collect obscure handhelds in the present day and want to share your purchasing tips. Either way, I'd love to hear from you, so please get typing in that comment section. But before I go, I must thank all of my law patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. Giving special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, James Taylor, Neptune, Chaotic, Seth Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamer Man, Tiago Piera Dos Santos Silva, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now, where you can get access to a host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.